despite all the gargantuan efforts and the gallant endeavor of uh, activists in the reparations movement, we just haven't been able to make the message a mainstream issue. The younger generation has to have a much deeper sense of history so that they begin to recognize that, uh, that the reparations movement has an important role to play. Deep inside me dwells a soul so old that it's seen a thousand centuries unfold. Born between the shores of the Tigris and Euphrates. Born long before we defined our blackness with blowout combs, afros, and dashikis. My soul came of age walking upon the desolate and burning sands where the great pyramids now stand. And it became strong in the belly of slave ships and at the end of overseers' whips to find the deplorable death the slave traders tried to deal it. No longer history. Read between the lines and the lies and see our story. Deeper than allegory. Disseminate fact from fiction and pray God delivers us from this deceitful diction. It's very important that we acknowledge that when we're talking about reparation, we're really talking about quest for truth and justice in America. We need to find out exactly what happened, what impact it has had on where we are, and what kind of repair would be required for any notion of justice. Now we know that General Sherman marched and burned his way to the sea from Atlanta to Savannah. And when we think about Sherman's swift column, followed by hordes that we call the headless black host, thousands of black slaves made their way behind Sherman's swift columns. And General Sherman made his way on down to Savannah, came through Richmond Hill, took down the Confederate fortifications here. On the 22nd of December, 1865, Savannah capitulated. It was given up by the Confederate forces, surrendered. However, we do know that on Christmas Day, General Sherman telegraphed President Lincoln and said, I will present to you today Savannah, Georgia as a Christmas present. We have captured the city of Savannah. And then General Sherman asked the question of Secretary of War, Edwin Stanton. What do I do with these black people who are no longer enslaved? What do I tell them? What do they want? And Edwin Stanton had the wisdom to tell General Sherman, ask their leaders. And who were their leaders? The black ministers of Savannah, 20 of them. And therefore on that prophetic day, January 12, 1865, on the second floor of the Green Meldrum Mansion, they met, and Garrison Frazier was the spokesman, a tall, proud black man with a commanding presence, well over six feet tall. And in my mind's eye, I see seated around that table, I see Garrison Frazier standing, addressing General Sherman. And Garrison Frazier, the spokesman said, when they asked him, what do you want? He said, we want to be educated. We want to own land. We want to have the freedom to worship as we please. We want to have jobs, our own schools. And seated next to General Sherman is the bearded Edwin Stanton. And they so impressed General Sherman. Four days later, after the meeting took place on January 12, 1865, history was made in America when General William T. Sherman issued Special Field Order Number 15, which has now become known throughout American history and has reverberated throughout American history as 40 acres and a mule. He said, Special Field Order Number 15 shall carry the following provisions. All of the captured southern plantations extending from Fernandina Beach, Florida, on through the St. John's River in Jacksonville, through the Golden Isle, St. Simons, Jekyll Island, Claire to Tybee, shall be given to those blacks as reparations for wrongdoings against them during slavery. 
However, when President Lincoln was assassinated, the special provisions of Field Order 15 were rescinded by President Johnson, and the lands were restored to those former Confederates. So African Americans, we still are looking for our proverbial 40 acres and a mule. Now, President Andrew Johnson was an exemplary white supremacist who radically disagreed with Abe Lincoln's later years. Abe Lincoln himself did not believe America could produce a multiracial democracy until the last few years of his life, last few months, actually, when he supported the um, voting rights of blacks in New Orleans, and that was the reason why John Wilkes Booth put a bullet through his head a white supremacist who killed Lincoln because Lincoln was willing to experiment with multiracial democracy. Andrew Johnson was a white supremacist who did not believe multiracial democracy was a possibility at all. Now many, if not most, white citizens in America agreed with Andrew Johnson, because Abe Lincoln had agreed before. But Abe changed his mind. Andrew didn't. So he saw the priority being preserve property rights even of Confederate landholders who had tried to engage in the most vicious, violent insurrection overthrowing the U.S. government, because that's what the Confederacy was. A lot of people think Black Panther Party concerned about violent overthrow the U.S. government. No, no, no. They were just protecting themselves against police out of control. The Confederacy was this subversive group that tried to overthrow American government violently. And the same president then, Andrew Johnson, after the war, wants to reward them and compensate them even though they initiated the violent insurrection. That's what white supremacy does to folk. They do some crazy things. They do some insane things. And so the, the, the rescinding of the order was a, a sign that these particular black peoples whose presence in the Union Army had made it possible to triumph over the Confederacy. We gotta keep that in mind, too, you see. But these particular peoples would receive not only no special treatment, you see, but we're not interested in them being fellow citizens in this democratic experiment, even though their presence helped preserve it, you see. So that the, the white supremacists, uh, commitments of President Andrew Johnson were just overwhelming. So in some ways, we shouldn't be surprised when he rescinded that, the order number 15. Yes. I mean, it seems to me very unlikely that General Sherman was burdened by an abstract concern simply to, you know, to love, embrace, shower gifts upon uh, the black man. I don't think that's what you're looking at. What you're looking at is a man conducting a war and you're looking at people following him about while he's doing that, people who've been recently freed. But who were these people? These were people who had worked the land. These were people who had carried the South. Why would they be enslaved if it was not their job, basically, to keep the system going? And they did. And so, if it breaks down because of the foolishness, foolhardiness of people, its leaders, who concerned to fire upon Fort Sumner and begin this great conflagration, what would you sensibly do and humanely do other than try to settle these wandering populations who were obviously perfectly capable of working the soil and doing it well? So the whole idea of 40 acres and a mule is not some great ideological project. It simply says, if you have people in distress, sort out the distress. There were some black people who did receive reparations, you see. And uh, that was already a sign then that the U.S. government is capable of acknowledging the damage done and the need for some just repair to address that damage. Uh, and the rescinding sent a sign that, oh, lo and behold, it looks as if the Union has won the war, but white supremacy is going to win the peace. And that's exactly what happened. Which means we gotta have another struggle 80 years later to push back white supremacy in this new form. And then even after the 60s, we're still struggling with it now. That's a fundamental part of the history of America. America at its best 
black, white, red, and yellow struggling against white supremacy based on moral principles. America at its worst, falling into the comfortable mode of denial, evasion, ignorance, avoidance of white supremacy in its various forms. And America has never even engaged in a quest for serious reconciliation based on truth and justice. There have been civil rights bills, there has been affirmative action, all of those were efforts in the, in, in, in the direction of, of, of talking about reconciliation. But the deeper truths, not just about slavery, but about Jim Crow, Jane Crow, lynching, police brutality, all of these are part and parcel of a past that's continually sh shaping of the present, you see. Reparations is not just about compensatory justice or distributive justice. It's about transitional justice. It's about transitioning from a, a bad regime to a better regime, from an unjust regime to a just regime. And so if we think about that in the context of the United States, we never fully made the transition because the people who needed to be empowered through a transition to a free and just society were not empowered. They were, they were instead disempowered and forced back down. One of the reasons why you want to try to come to terms with reparation is there were so many high quality people on the plantations uh, locked into sharecropping who had a spirit and who had a, uh, an integrity that was higher than that of presidents. It was higher than that of businessmen. And that's where you come from at your best. And that tradition was one that was uh, uh, denied and their suffering overlooked, and yet they ended up producing Fannie Lou Hamer, Martin Luther King Jr., Willie Mays, Curtis Mayfield, uh, uh, Smokey Robinson, uh, W.B. Du Bois, I mean, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington, these are the towering figures in American civilization. Well, where'd they come from? They came from the plantation. That's what their people. Now, there must have been a rich tradition that could produce these folk, a rich tradition. And we're going to deny the circumstances under which this tradition was produced, even though we want to benefit from that genius? Hey, you can't have it both ways. You take a man, put him in a chicken coop, have him raise his seeds as chickens. On chicken, they grow into little chickens with chicken little mentalities. I can't stand up because the sky is falling. The sky has fallen. Our drive has fallen. Our pride has fallen. You take a chicken. You put it in a woman's house and have it raise its seeds on chicken. Like chicken, they grow into little people with chicken little mentalities. I can't stand up because the body from the trees are pouring. Our men are crawling. My Leaders have fallen. Many of the problems that we encounter today, many of the social disturbances and many of the difficulties that we experience are a direct consequence of the experiences that we had during slavery and, and Jim Crow, uh, post-slavery uh, 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 kinds of traumas. Now that we are beginning to know more about DNA, and DNA transmission, it's very clear that things that happen to traumatize people, whether it's uh, 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 experiencing a nuclear explosion, or uh, being exposed to something catastrophic like earthquakes, how those things actually so alter and so terrorize people's psychological makeup that even in front of future generations, there are signs of those things reoccurring. So what was the impact of multi-generational trauma on people over time? What happens to people when for 300 years they were experiencing generation after generation some of the most inhuman brutality? One interesting piece of data that came out several years ago was when the uh, so-called African Cemetery uh, was discovered at, uh, uh, in the Wall Street area of New York. 
And uh, as you may recall, there was a study, a forensic study, of uh, looking at the bones, looking at how these people died. And what they've been able to show is that these people were brutalized. And these were New York slaves who somehow like had broken bones, had uh, you know, certain types of structures in their skulls and other parts of their bodies uh, that showed that they had lived extremely uh, uh, lives that were devastated by brutality and physical injuries. The thing to keep in mind is that post-trauma is based upon realistic traumatic events. It's realistic traumatic events. Martin Luther King Jr. is dead because he stood up as a man. Malcolm is dead because he stood up as a man. And the history is both post-slavery, and those are events in, in recent history, but all the way back, whenever African people stood up to simply do for themselves, to affirm for themselves, to construct for themselves, to build institutions, to define who they wanted to be, to do the research, they were punished severely, often by death. So the idea then of trying to escape the plantation, either mentally or to escape the plantation physically, still constitutes a real threat because of the terror that was used to control the behavior of the slaves. Mm -hmm. We know, of course, uh, uh, the tactics used by the Klan and the tactics used by the white supremacists were ones of terror. I mean, they would, in fact, ride at night dressed as ghosts to be able to somehow make it difficult for people to sleep and to put fear into the hearts of people. And how the lynchings were done as public displays. The people were hung and left in the streets, castrated, left in the streets. And people were paraded by to see, this is what happens to those Negroes who try to act like they have a right to be free. This is what happens to people who want to vote. This is what happens to people who want to build something in, in, their, in our neighborhoods. You know, they're going to burn a cross in your yard burn an effigy, and if in fact, if they could find somebody black, they would hang them and kill them to show this is what happens when you cross the line that we've drawn. That's terror. That's real terror. And that's the terror that we experienced for 300 years, and we are still reacting to it, even though we're 140 years past uh, the Emancipation Proclamation. What's not as clear is the what, what can be recorded is how did people respond to that trauma? What did they do? I mean, how did they somehow give themselves relief from the terror, from the pain, from the constant fear, from the constant concern that my wife will be killed, my children will be destroyed, I will be brutalized? How, how did they deal with that psychologically? There are no records on that. One of the things that, that has not been very well understood or even looked at is in terms of what is it that happens to people who multi-generationally are abusers? And that is that uh, if in fact uh, the slaves, the African people, were in fact abused in this way transgenerationally, someone was doing the abuse. And then what begins to happen to the psychology of people who deal with unrepentant brutality. And so if over the course of those, uh, uh, what, 15, 20 generations, over 300 years, uh, were in fact engaged with this uh, socialization, that not only do we have a right to treat these human beings as if they're animals, not only do we have a right to rape these women, to murder these men, to treat these human beings as beasts of burden, but we also have built up a whole uh, uh, storehouse of data and information which justifies that. When this kind of propaganda is given to generation after generation, little white boys are taught that they are superior to this black boy who somehow has to clean uh, their stables. Or when little white girls are taught that they are superior to this black woman who has to help her with her toiletries. When they are socialized that way, generation after generation, the conclusion is, is that 
We have no moral responsibility. We have no need to experience any kind of real psychological guilt because we are brutalizing these people and treating them less than human. Gentlemen, I am here to help you solve some of your problems with slaves. I have experimented with some of the newest and still the oldest methods for control of slaves. Whether or not there was a man named Willie Lynch who actually laid out this psychological process or not, we have adequate documentation to show this is what went on and we are still suffering from it, whether the letter was actually accurate or not. And we can document many of the things that he describes. Now, what Willie Lynch described was a, just a very simple uh, social psychology experiment. And that is that if you disrupt those things that build unity and community cohesion and do it systematically, then you can begin to destroy the people's respect for their own unity and they in fact become allies to your destructiveness rather than allies to their own freedom and liberation. You must use the dark-skinned slaves versus the light-skinned slaves and the light-skinned slaves versus the dark-skinned slaves. You must use the female versus the male, and the male versus the So today, the in the 21st century, you know, we are in fact facing the same kind of divisiveness, the same kind of division, of fighting against each other with more focus on how do you and I differ. If you live in Georgia and I live in Alabama, as opposed to looking at the common problems that we say uh, we have as a community. The black slave, after receiving this indoctrination, shall carry on and will become self-refueling and self-generating for hundreds of years, maybe thousands. In the same way that the enslavement process, that is making Africans into slaves, required them to disrupt institutions that preserved our autonomy, our dignity, our power, and to in impose instead definitions of their autonomy their power, their effectiveness, in much the same way that that happened historically. In contemporary situations, there are so many things built into the society that it isn't even necessary for uh, a white master to do that because we do it ourselves now. Uh, one of the things that slavery has done is that it has built in this kind of self-destructive orientation in our own thinking. Gentlemen, my plan is guaranteed. And the good thing about this plan is that if used intensely for one year, the slaves themselves will remain perpetually distrustful. I watched the baby cry cradled in a crib, crying to be a man, dying to be a man, trying to be a man. Why didn't his mother come to soothe these tears? Lull him lullabies from her candy-coated constitution, call his forefathers. Why doesn't he rock his restless baby to sleep? Mute his moans, don't you mock him, daddy. He hears what you won't say, and we all see what you do. The John Conyers called in 1989 uh, for a conversation, because the resolution simply calls for a commission to engage in inquiry about how America goes about talking about wrestling and grappling with the impact of slavery on the present. Congressman Conyers' bill was, I think, in part motivated, not entirely, but in part motivated by the fact that Japanese Americans who had been interned during World War II had just received reparations from, you know, of, of all administrations, the Reagan administration. So, um, so no one questions the legitimacy or the moral correctness of giving reparations to Japanese Americans who were interned during World War II and lost their civil liberties and lost property and um, basic human rights be, uh, uh, that they should get reparations. But the question has always been, well, if we can give reparations for these kinds of injuries, to the Japanese Americans, why can't we give reparations to African Americans 
who have suffered those injuries and more and for a longer period of time in this country. I salute uh, my dear brother John Conyers. He, he introduces it every year. He's gained a little bit more support, even got a little Republican support for a while. But uh, it shows again that the Congress is not willing to, to really confront truth and justice in this regard. Uh, and we have to continually support uh, Conyers' efforts, Congressman John Conyers' efforts to at least generate this conversation. I guess it was back in 2001, I went to the United Nations World Conference Against Racism in Durban, South Africa. And one of the things that almost derailed that conference was the issue of reparations. Because of course, in trying to um, formulate some, some policies uh, that would combat racism, uh, the issue of reparations of course came up. And uh, the United States of course was under the Bush administration was very much opposed to participating in any conference where reparations for slavery would be discussed. They sent a low-level delegate, actually Congressman Lantos, I believe, of California, and he made some accusations against the other delegates and then walked away from uh, the table. So there never really was a serious discussion of reparations, and this is part of the problem with Congressman Conyers' bill um, which he has been you know, trying to get past, I believe, since 1989. None of the reparations cases that I'm aware of have ever uh, been heard, uh, as we say in the law, on the merits. They've always been dismissed without any discussion of the merits of the case and based on, on procedural uh, mechanisms like uh, time bar, statute of limitations, standing, uh, sovereign immunity. Uh, these are mechanisms that the court uses in order to, uh, to limit its docket and to get rid of what he considers to be frivolous claims. In 1995, the uh, Ninth Court of Appeals, a very liberal California court, uh, brought before, had brought before it uh, some very serious uh, arguments about the claim for reparations. And the response of the court was twofold. On the one hand, you had a principle of sovereign immunity, which meant that U.S. government has a consent to have itself sued, which means then you more than likely have to go to the legislature rather than the courts in this regard. And that was one of the major effects. The second was the statute of limitations, which means you only have a certain set amount of years of persons who had suffered. It was a six year uh, statute. Uh, and of course, this has been now 100 years, so it makes it more difficult. The shift to the private sector, litigation shifting to the private sector, I think is a very appropriate uh, one, and I think we've got to hit all fronts. The thing that's, I think, extremely creative about going after uh, corporations as opposed to going after the government is, of course, corporations don't have the kinds of legal protections that the government has. The government has sovereign immunity. It has to agree to be sued. Corporations don't have to agree to be sued. What a lot of people uh, uh, still don't understand is the extent to which the corporations were deeply involved in, um, in taking advantage of slave labor, both uh, during slavery and after slavery. So uh, after slavery officially ended. You really have to be able to wrap your brain around the idea of actually owning another human being. 
and that that human being is a piece of property. And what can you do with property? You can buy it and you can sell it. But if you have an interest in the productivity of your investment, you're going to insure it. So Edna is an insurance company that would sell insurance policies to slave owners on their slaves so that if the slave got sick or got injured or died, the master could collect the insurance money. This is like, um, you know, the same thing if you owned a machine. You know, this is like business risk insurance, right? Or homeowner's insurance. Well, you had, you know, slave insurance. See, what a tangle web we weave when we conspire to deceive. Because, see, I know Mr. Dope Dealer, Mr. Heavy Wheeler, Mr. Baller Shot Caller, Mr. Motorola Buffalo Soldier. Because he don't put shoes on my feet, clothes on my back, and food on my plate to eat. But, see, why can't they see it just a vicious cycle? Why can't they remember? Why can't they remember that last boat ride? Why can't they remember how they lied? Why can't they remember the sound of the whip across our mother's hips? Why can't they remember the lashes across our father's back? Why can't they remember S-L-A-V-E-R? Why are we still shucking and jiving? I ain't shucking and jiving for nobody. Yay! Yeah. Slavery was a precondition for American democracy. American democracy could never have taken off. It would have never emerged without background conditions of slaves providing the labor to create a, an economy that would serve as the pillar for democratic possibilities, rights, liberties for white men and so on. So that if you can't come to terms, it's like I, I, my mother's a precondition to me. I wouldn't be here without her being in place to produce me. Well, in fact, see, slavery is a precondition of American democracy. One of the things that the more recent um, reparations uh, cases have sought is uh, an accounting. How much money was made from slavery? Because there are certain conservative historians who want to claim, well, that slavery was inefficient and that people actually lost money. But I don't think that a system of labor like slavery would have lasted all the way up into the 20th century if it was not profitable. American slavery produced unbelievable wealth. And that wealth became the basis of those who remain wealthy as they use that money to invest in other venues. And so, look at the Ivy League institutions, I mean, Yale University, significant amount of its wealth is based on slave labor. And U.S. capital, built by slave labor. You see, various uh, um, private company that you've, you, you've mentioned here uh, was able to get off the ground, its initial wave of capital, slave labor, slave trade, and so forth, so that the issue of production of wealth and the role of slavery in producing wealth has yet to be fully appreciated in our country. It goes right back, of course, to slavery itself, but it goes beyond slavery. As I say, slavery effectively concludes in 65, forget about 63. If it effectively concludes in 1865, of course, discrimination, which is just a replacement for it, doesn't. And discrimination means a systematic way in which you package people, and you put them into a particular community, and you deprive them of rights and access so that there's only one thing left for them to do, and that is to work for you. And of course, if you create a cheap source of labor, then in effect, that's exactly what you had under slavery. It's just packaged in a slightly different way. CSX was a railroad company. And through the convict lease system, the system by which African Americans were arrested and charged, usually on bogus criminal charges, and then were required to pay the costs of their 
imprisonment or their court fees, and if they couldn't afford to pay for it, then they were farmed out to private corporations and they had to work off their debt. That's, in large respects, how the railroad system in the South was built. I beat a bumblebee through history until it thought it was a butterfly, pollinated my flowers and never stung, kept it in a jar that I shook until it thought it was jelly, spread it across my bread as needed to fill my belly. Won't you buzz for me, bumblebee butterfly, as if that stinger still works. Work for me, bumblebee butterfly. Never neglect the nectar that made you worthwhile as I ride the hide of your hive, you honeydew bumblebee butterfly. The biggest separation right now between um, black brothers and sisters and white brothers and sisters is, uh, is wealth, even more than income. We've got now a black middle class that's been thriving, uh, but it's a black middle class that's thriving in terms of its access to income as opposed to wealth. Wealth is based on property. Wealth is based on savings. Wealth is based on what is inherited from those who uh, came before you. And the slavery, as well as Jim Jane Crow, made it nearly impossible for most black people to ever gain any access to wealth. All they could have is a job that provides financial remunerations at the workplace. But that's income. And if they lose that job, they're in deep trouble. Our young people are just completely overcome by wearing flashy clothes, flashy cars, any kind of thing that symbolically says I have worth and value. So it's almost as if property, rather than a source of real wealth, power, and community integrity, has simply become this symbolic thing that people use as a token of power, rather than substantive and genuine power. But in the music, it's got the struggle in hip hop culture, struggle with rap music, all of these things. If you're true to black music, you gotta be true to truth and justice about black people. And if you're true to the justice and truth about black people, you gotta talk about the damage as well as the resistance. You gotta talk about the need for compensation as well as the need for affirmation, you see. Reparations, if it is not accompanied by a repairing of the mind, are repairing of the motives, repairing of the aspirations, repairing of the goals, simply becomes another way to re-enslave us. And one of the argue, one of the jokes that, of course, Dave Chappelle has done and some other people is that if you give African Americans a trillion dollars today, we would simply like infuse a trillion dollars into the economy by Monday. You know. So if there's a problem with the, the economic deficit, give us a trillion dollars and we will multiply it and bring it back to you by Monday morning. And the economy will be boosted. And that's essentially where we are. But that's a statement about the fact that you must repair the mind. You must repair the thinking. You must repair the spirit. Under the right growing conditions, a flower never has to ask the sun to shine. And on gray days, the clouds speak in yesterdays and the sunshine sings in tomorrows. I've never seen gravity stop a bird from flying, and death has never forever forgotten a smile. And even under the wrong growing conditions, the lawn never has to ask the sun to shine, and even the brown grass feels soft under my feet. We've got to shape public opinion. We have to convince persons that this is not some kind of narrow legalistic affair, that this is a fundamental issue of truth and justice, and it has much to do with bringing Americans together. I think that um, some people may oppose reparations because, again, they think that it's a handout. They think that blacks are asking for something that they don't deserve or that no one else has ever gotten. There's so many um, weapons of mass distraction that keep people inattentive to the things that matter most. The crucial thing, it seems to me, is focus. Concentration on what needs to be doing, needs doing. Avoidance of distractions, which are real distractions, and attending to business. I think we need three fronts. One is we need to have a massive support of John Conyers' H.R. 40, because that would provide much 
uh, public limelight once you get Congress involved. Secondly, you have to support those groups like in COBRA and the Reparations Committee led by Randall Robinson, Charles Ogletree, and others so that they have a, a prominent presence uh, in not just black community but in the larger American society. And then third, we have to in some way be connected on local levels to those groups on the ground, grassroots organizations that include reparations as part and parcel of their programs when the artists, it's when the writers, it's when the spokespersons, it's when the leaders, it's when the highly visible folk really begin to bring their voices to bear on the issue that it begins has impact on everyday folk, then their elected officials and you get a shift in paradigms from reparations being somehow on the margins to being much more central to not just black people's predicament, but America's predicament.